Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. And we receive your word this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We're going to take hold of it. We're going to apply it in our life. And we thank you that it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share with you on the subject of true repentance. True repentance. God wants us to understand what repentance means and that we would see true repentance come forth in our life and understand what real repentance is. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, which is what you, well, you and I are all to be established in, let us go on unto perfection. Otherwise, we're supposed to have these basic principles established. Then we grow up and go on to perfection in the Lord. Not laying again the foundation. This is the foundation. These are foundational things that must be established in every one of us. And what's the first one on the list? Of repentance from dead works. God wants us to understand that we are responsible to get this foundation principle laid in our life. We must have repentance from all dead works in our life. Dead works is anything that's not of God, anything that's contrary to His Word, anything that's not producing fruit, anything that would be of sin, anything that would be contrary to the way of the Word of God. When we talk about the word repentance, this particular Greek word is the word metanoe. Metanoe, meta means change, noe means mind. It literally means a change of mind. And this change of mind shows forth the fact that you have received God's word, but a change of mind also implies a change in action. That because you have a change in mind, you're now going to do differently. You're not going to walk in the ways that, according to what you used to think in your mind, but now with a change of mind, with your mind being renewed to the truth, you're going to turn away from the things that are not of the Lord. Now, there's a Hebrew word, wherever repentance, we're going to go over to Genesis and chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And we see here in verse 6 where this particular Hebrew word for repent, which again refers to a change of heart or, or disposition, change of mind, change of purpose, and emphasizing one's conduct when you study this word out. A change of mind. There's times when it applies to the people, but there's also times when it speaks of what God's attitude is that he changes his mind. And why would he change his mind? For good reason, because of the fact that people are either walking in line with his word so that they can see blessings, or if they're not, walk, they're walking contrary, then curses would come. And here we see, if we look back in verse 5, in Genesis 6, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you imagine how bad people were? We're not that bad yet. But if things go down the road and pe people get worse and worse, we might end up be that way before the end. But he says their thoughts was evil continually. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. He changed his mind and wished he had never made man on the earth. It grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I'll destroy man, whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man, beast, and creeping thing, and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I've made them. It was such a disappointment because of the fact that man did not follow his ways, that it grieved him such that he decided he was going to destroy him. But there was one, of course, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, which is Noah, because he was one who did walk after his ways. And he and his family were preserved, of course, but the flood came and destroyed all of the rest, as God said. God changed his mind about the fact that he had created man, and he was not pleased, of course, and brought the judgment that it came. We see that this would happen. Also, we see, though, when God purposed to do an evil thing, there's times when he would change his mind. Here's a case over in Exodus chapter 32. We see in verse 7, the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, they've corrupted themselves. This is after he went up there on the mount with the Lord, and he was gone for all those days, and, and they, they were started corrupting themselves. 
He said, they've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them, and they've made them a molten calf and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed there unto it, said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I've seen this people. <coughs> Behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I'll make of thee a great nation. He's ready to destroy them all. So he goes on and he says, Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thou wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains, to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. And he said further, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants. And what's that speaking of? The covenant that he made. He says, Remember the covenant, essentially, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I'll multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I've spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. You made this covenant, swore by yourself. You've got to carry this out. You can't destroy these people. You've got to carry this out. Essentially, is what he's saying. And the Lord repented of the evil which he had thought to do unto his people. Quite an amazing circumstance. But God changed his mind and did not carry out the evil against them. When we talk about repentance, we're talking about someone changing their mind and then having different action. Now, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 18, Jeremiah chapter 18, we see here in verse 8. He says, If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I'll repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. This is a nation that would deserve judgment, but if they turn from it, God will change his mind and won't bring judgment upon them. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it? If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good, of what he purposed. Wherefore I said I would benefit them. He's going to repent and change of that. Instead, then what's going to happen? Evil things are going to come upon them. That shows the fact that if someone obeys God, they're going to get blessed. But if they quit obeying God, God's going to change his mind. And, of course, his word is what is the judge in all the earth. And curses are going to come upon that person. Everything occurs according to God's word. And so we must see that as we obey, God will bring blessings. But if we don't, then curses could come upon us. And God can change his mind from things according to his word because we have changed our ways. That's why we've got to walk in God's ways so that we don't see any destructive things happen in our life. In Joel chapter 2, verse 13, and speaking about repentance, in Joel 2, 13, this is where the land was desolate in chapter 1, and God called them to the place of where they were supposed to repent, they were supposed to get themselves right, and they were to fast and pray. And in verse 13, he said, Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. If they would turn their heart, God would change his mind of the judgments that were coming upon them. God, that God will do that if he, meets, if he sees someone's heart be changed. And that shows you something. God is looking upon the heart. And what needs to change in our life? Our heart. God is looking at your heart. And everything is going to proceed from the motivation of what is inside you on the heart. If there's a change of heart, then God will change judgments that would come upon us. It says a change of heart will be, of course, shown in a change of action. Now we see another scripture over in Jeremiah chapter 15. So God is long-suffering, remember. He doesn't want to bring judgments. At the same time, people that say they're going to do something and don't do it, he gets weary with them. He goes on and says in Jeremiah 15, 6, Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord, thou art gone backward. Therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I'm weary with repenting. They were supposedly repenting and then he go back. Oh, we're going to get right and we'll do the right thing. And then they go back and do it again. And they were supposedly repenting and then going back again. He gets weary with people 
that sit there and say, well, I repent, I confess my sin, and then go back and do the same old thing again. He was weary of it. And of course, if we don't choose to walk in the ways of the Lord and be obedient to Him, and we show a pattern of continually going in the same old ways and sins, even though, you know, and supposedly confessing them and getting, and then supposedly repenting, but we really don't because we go back into them. God gets weary of that. And judgments will come upon a person. In Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, in verse 10, here it says, where God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. Remember that Jonah went to Nineveh and preached to them, finally, after being disobedient, preached to them, pronouncing that judgment was going to come upon them except they repent. Well, God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented, changed his mind of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. If God sees our change showing repentance, which was evidenced by their works, you see, your actions show forth whether you've really repented. Not just words. Words, talk is cheap. How does God know what we, where we're at? It's by our walk. People can say they're going to do something, but then they go and do something else. That's why you never follow what someone just says alone. You look at the actions. You look at whether or not they're carrying out the things that they say. That shows you. you know, and then you can, of course, see the fruit in their life of whether or not they really are walking in the way. Your works are important. They show forth whether there is true repentance in a person's life. Over in Jeremiah, chapter 8. Jeremiah, chapter 8, and verse 6. Jeremiah 8, verse 6. He said, I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Every man turned to his course as the horse runneth into the battle. None of them repented of their wickedness. They just kept on doing their same old thing. God is expecting us to repent when he brings his correction to us, when he brings his word to us and shows us what we're to do. He said nobody was repenting of this. And so they weren't speaking right, so God was not pleased. People were choosing the way of rebellion. Real repentance is necessary if we're going to stop judgments coming upon us in our life. We cannot do just whatever we want to do and just think that God just understands because of our circumstances or whatever. No, he's looking at your actions, he's looking at what goes on in your life, and he's going to find out whether you're going to walk right or not. He says, no man repented of the wickedness. They had wickedness in their heart as they were not choosing the way of the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 19. Surely after that I was turned, and I repented. Then after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. This shows you what should happen. When someone hears the word of God, he says, after that I was turned. He turned from it. Otherwise, he was convicted of the truth. He turned from it. He started to, and he said he repented. And then he was instructed, and he had shame confounded because of bearing the reproach of his youth of all the evil things that he had done. Of course, the important thing is to turn away from all the evil things we've done and not continue in them. This shows a real attitude of repentance. When the word came and he heard it was wrong in God's sight, he turned away from it. He repented. He changed his mind. He got God's instruction. And he was ashamed. He had a shame over the things that he had done in the past. And when you have a godly shame, a godly sorrow over the things of the past, you'll turn away from it because of the fact that you have disobeyed God and you've turned away from the way of the Lord and not done the things that he wants you to do. We want to have real repentance. And real repentance is shown by a true godly sorrow that will cause us to change so that we do not walk in the ways of sin any longer. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 3, we see in verse 1 where John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness, and he said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand, or literally means it's drawn near. Repent. They were expected to repent. And again, this is the word metanoia, which means to change one's mind and if you do so, you're going to change your ways. As Young's just translated, reform. Otherwise, 
If you're really going to change your ways, you're going to you're, you're going to really repent. You're going to re reform yourself. You're not going to walk in the same ways any longer. You're going to do the things that God wants you to do. Now, when he's talking here about them repenting, this was a statement that he made that was a command. Imperative mood. Repentance is a command from God. It is not an option. It is not a nice thought or a nice consideration. It is a command from God. And notice, he expects this to not just be for a moment, but present tense. Ongoing change in your life that will bring forth fruit and bring forth walking in the ways of the Lord. He said, you need, guys all need to repent, change your ways, because the kingdom, the rule and the reign of heaven is at hand or draws near. So they needed to choose that way. Well, we see down in verse 8. He says, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. As he told them they were supposed to repent and change their ways, he said, well, you're going to bring forth fruits meet for repentance. This is speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees that came. And he just says to them, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, or showing forth that you really have repented. That tells us something else. Repentance is not only a command from God, but it also is a spoken that you must have fruit. Fruit comes forth from change. And that now you're not just change your mind and just sit there and do nothing. No, you're now going to change your action and your ways, and you're now going to walk in a new way, evidenced by fruit that is coming forth in your life. It is important that we understand that without fruit, a person has not repented in their life, from God's standpoint. In verse 10, he says, Now also the axe is laid into the root of the tree. Therefore, every truth tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down. Remember, we're the trees. And if we don't bring forth good fruit, we're hewn down, we're cast into the fire. That means you're cooked, you're not going to make it, you're not saved, you're finished. Because he expects us to walk in his ways. Therefore, we must have true repentance, which is going to be evidenced by our fruit, because again he says that he knows us by our fruit. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, and he said the same thing. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or literally draws near, is drawn near. So here, we see that Jesus was proclaiming the same thing to them. He's bringing the gospel, but what's he bringing? He's first telling them, repent, as he's bringing the gospel of the kingdom. You've got to change your ways. If you're going to receive the things that Jesus is bringing, we've got to repent and turn away from all of these things that are evil in his sight. Anything that is of sin, anything that's of the flesh, Anything that's of the world, we must turn away from it. Mark chapter 6, verse 12. He says, they went out and they preached that men should repent. They went out and preached the gospel. What did they do? They said, you've got to repent. You've got to change your ways. A lot of times people just go out and just preach the fact that, well, just get born again. But they don't talk about them preach, changing their ways. You see, it's not just getting born again and then continuing in your ways that you've been in. No, it's change your ways and get born again. Change your ways, conform your life now to the way of the Lord. You cannot continue to walk in the ways of your own and the ways of the flesh or the ways of the world any longer. So they went out and preached that men should repent. They had to repent. They had to change their mind. They had to make the right choices. And it was in the subjunctive mood, meaning the fact that they might repent, preaching that men might repent. Otherwise, it's all conditional upon men choosing to hearken unto the word that was brought forth. Just because the word goes forth doesn't mean that people repent. They might repent if they take hold of the word and they act upon it and do what it says. Over in Luke chapter 13. In Luke 13, we see over here in verse 3. He says, if we go back for a moment. Here he's speaking about the Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered things. He says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all perish. It wasn't just them. It was everybody. If you don't repent and change your ways, you're going to perish. That's quite a statement. Otherwise, you can't sign on the dotted line and continue your ways and think you're not going to perish. God makes it very clear that repentance is absolutely necessary to be right with God. So, here he was telling them that 
except you repent, and that's for all of us, except we repent and turn away from things, then we could easily perish. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, we see what Jesus did. He said, go and learn what, I, what, mean, what that meaneth, that I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am come, not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He calls us to repentance from walking as a sinner in the ways of the world. Of course, we've got to get converted, get born again. We also, though, must turn and change our ways. We cannot continue in the ways that are contrary to the word of God. Well, as they're going forth, we see over here in verse four, Mark chapter 1, verse 4, when John was baptized in the wilderness, he was preaching the baptism of repentance. So when he's calling him, he's getting him baptized, but what was it all about? Repentance for the remission of sins, so that they would change their ways. And remember that baptism in the Old Testament was the first step towards entering into the priesthood. And so what was the first thing they had to do? There was all the fact that the kingdom was coming, which meant the priesthood was going to come for everybody because that was the prophecy out of Exodus 19. And so therefore, they had to all repent. If they were all going to be priests, they had to have themselves right before God for the remission of sins to occur in their life. So that was the baptism as he was declaring. He was preaching. You guys got to repent, not just baptize them only. Repent. It was a baptism of repentance that they were repenting from their sins and then as they were being baptized, which was a declaration of what they had, the fact that they had turned and they were ready to come into the priesthood. Mark 1.15, he said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God's at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. It wasn't just believe the gospel alone. Here's some good news, just believe this good news and, and get born again and everything will be great. No. Again, what always preceded all these things? Repent. A lot of people don't bring out repent. They just bring out good news, and we do preach the gospel, of course, of good news, but at the same time, we can't forget about what is said. And again, when he talks about repentance, repentance is changing your mind, showing a change of action. It's imperative. It's a command. It is not a suggestion. And it is in the present tense, which means this repentance should have ongoing effect ongoing change of mind and change of action in your life, that you're not going to go back to the same old ways. In Matthew, in chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, we see over in verse 20, he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. He was doing these mighty works, and he was manifesting the rule and the reign of the kingdom, healing the sick, casting out the demons, and yet they didn't repent. He said, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto it, you be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment for you than for you, because they should have repented at seeing the mighty works that he did, and yet they would not repent. It goes on and says, But thou, Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell, for if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Otherwise, he's saying, they would have repented. These great mighty works that were done in Capernaum, you guys should be on your face repenting. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee, because of the fact that they did not repent at the mighty works of the Lord. As God is doing a work in your life, that certainly should bring you to the place of repentance from all sin. Have you seen God answer a prayer? Have you seen him bring a healing? Have you seen him do a, some kind of a work to bring forth some manifestation of his power and his authority working in your life to deliver you, to heal you, to set you free, to bring you out of some bondage? My, if we've seen the works of God done in our life, we should be repenting from everything. There's absolutely no excuse for anybody in the New Testament era, era certainly, to have not repented from all areas of sin in their life. In Matthew chapter 12, we see over in verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here, Jesus was here, and they wouldn't listen to him. And he was preaching, declaring the truth to them, and yet they would not turn and repent. So, he says there's going to be a greater condemnation. That tells you something. When the word's coming into you, 
it is important that you be ready to take hold of it. We talk to you often about having your repentance shoes on, being ready to change, being ready to take hold of the Word and apply the Word in your life and be a doer of it. In the New Testament era, there is no excuse for any of us repenting any longer. We should all be ready to be quick to repent. In fact, we see a scripture over in Acts. Acts chapter 17, over here in verse 30. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at in the past. But now there is no ignorance. Now we have revelation from the Holy Spirit. We're born again. Our eyes are open. There's no excuse now. Now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In the New Testament era, there is an absolute command for everybody to repent. Now, in Matthew chapter 21, so otherwise, trying to say, make any kind of little excuses or whatever to the Lord about why you haven't done the Word of God in areas, it's not going to hold water. It won't hold water for one second with him. Matthew 21, verse 28. He says, What think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented, changed his mind, and he went. He was rebellious and resistant at first, but he did change his mind, and then he showed forth repentance because his actions showed forth that he had done it by going forth. He went out there and began to work in the vineyard. He came to the second and said likewise. He answered and he said, I go, sir. Otherwise, he had good intentions, but he went not. Lots of people can have good intentions to repent, good intentions to do what God says but then never do it. Good intentions don't make it with God. Good intentions don't show repentance. Well, a lot of people say, well, I know I haven't done this, but God knows my heart. Yeah, he knows your heart. It is wicked. It is not right. You may think it's right, but it's not right. It is wicked because you haven't carried out what you're supposed to have carried out. Because if it really was in your heart, out of the boundaries of your heart, your mouth will speak. It'll direct your, all the things that you do because it's out of the heart the proceed things that defile a person. Therefore, good intentions don't make it. You can be in agreement with God and all these things, oh yeah, I believe that and I want to do those things. But it all comes down to, are we carrying it out? Are we doing the things that he says? Are we showing forth fruit? Which of them twain did the will of his father? When they say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto him, verily I say unto the publicans and the harlots, go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came not unto you in the way of righteousness, came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him, and you, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. In other words, we have to be sure that we are responding to his word and carrying out what he says, and evidence of it is going to be by your actions. In other words, repentance is not good intentions or just even a change of attitude of mind. It is deeper than that. It is shown in action and fruit in our life. In Luke 24, verse 47, he said that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. See, that's what's supposed to be going forth. The gospel of the kingdom, what Jesus did, but repentance. Repentance and change, turning away from the things of this world. Too many people are preaching a gospel that doesn't require people to change. People just bring their worldly ways in, their fleshly ways in, their continual sinful ways in, and just kind of, you know, live after the flesh and think that they're okay. That's, that's not a true gospel being preached. Repentance and remission of sins are what's to be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We even see over next. Chapter 2, what did he say they were supposed to be doing here? In verse 38, you see when he's preaching, this is after the response of Peter's sermon to them on the day of Pentecost. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart because what he had told them, the conclusion was that, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. God convicted them. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? 
When God's word comes to you, when the truth comes to you, that would be the response. What shall I do? What should I do to, for the word of God that's come and brought me the truth? And of course, what was the first thing that Peter said? Repent. Repent. You've got to change your ways. You've got to change your mind. You've got to change your actions. You're going to have to have change in your life. To be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, or this literally means this is not the word normally for in. It's a word, epi, which in this particular case, in the dative, would refer to it because of, or on the basis of, is the way you would translate it, according to Greek scholars. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, because of the name of Jesus Christ, for, or this is not the word for for, it's normally gar, it's G-A-R in the Greek, or because of the name of Jesus, unto, this really, usually is translated unto or into the remission of sins. You see, he'd already dealt with this back in verse 21 when he said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and their sins will be washed away. And so now, people have met, had not had this very clear understanding of what he's saying. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, because of the name of Jesus Christ that they would have called upon to be saved, un in, unto the remission of sins. And then he said, you shall take hold of the gift of the Holy Ghost. But notice the first thing he said, repent. You are going to repent, and you're going to have to change your ways, and you cannot continue to walk in the ways contrary to the Word of God. We see over in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts 3, 19. He says, repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now, that's something. He says, repent, which means to change your mind, of course. And then he says, be converted. So they needed to change their mind, actually, but they also needed to be converted. Converted, this particular word means a turning from and a turning to. You're turning away from something, and now you're going to turn to something, which was turning to God. Repent, change your mind, turn from all these things you should have turned away, you turn away from, and turn to God that your sins may be blotted out <clears throat> when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Again, what comes first? Repentance. What comes second? The being converted, turning away from, and turning to, positively, unto the Lord. And then what? Then your sins may be blotted out. And that's important. In fact, we see other places in the book of Acts about, this, about being converted. Over in Acts chapter 11, in verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned, this is the same word, turned unto the Lord. Turned away from something and turned unto the Lord. That's the attitude that we are to have. In Acts chapter 14, verse 15, Sirs, why do you do these things? We are um, also are men of like passions you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Again, this word turn, this epistrepho. It's the same word that's been used as converted, and it's talking about the fact that we must turn from something and unto something else. Not just turn from something and, not, and sit there and stay in whatever state we want to be in. See, repentance and being converted is not just, oh, I'm going to quit doing that. Well, I'm going to stop doing that, and I'm going to start doing what God says. There is a, a turning to God and a showing forth of new action, which is going to be shown forth by the fruit in our life. And that's important. We see another place over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of, man, of entering in we had unto you, and how we turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Same thing here. Same word. They turned from the idols, but they just didn't stop there. They turned to God, and then the action shown, the fruit shown, to do what? To serve the living and true God. So real repentance is going to see real change in your life. And real conversion is going to be shown because of the fact that you're going to be turning to God and you're going to be doing the actions and carrying out what he, what he expects for us to do and serving him. In Acts 5.31, he says this, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. See, a lot of people just think about the forgiveness of sins, but what about the repentance part? The repentance part, it precedes this. And this is an important part. When the gospel's preached, 
There must be a God for a preaching of repentance and change that has to come forth in a person's life. We see over in Acts chapter 11, verse 18, when they were rehearsing what happened at Cor with Cornelius and Peter was talking. And he says, when they heard these things, they held their peace, glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Otherwise, they said, hey, I see these guys. That's when the gospel came to Cornelius' house and he was rehearsing how they got born again and received the Holy Spirit and all the things that happened to them. He, that he granted repentance unto life. That's what it's going to produce. Real repentance is going to bring you to the place of seeing the life of God manifest in you because you're now going to walk in the ways of the Word of God. We see over in Acts chapter 19, in verse 4, <clears throat> where Paul, this is where he came and found some disciples at Ephesus, and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They didn't even know about any Holy Spirit. And they said, and what were you baptized? And then to John's baptism, he said, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. They had to turn from the way that they were thinking, and they had to now have new way of thinking and action, which was to believe on Jesus, of course, which they were going to have to receive him as their personal Lord and Savior. And so they got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They showed repentance by change of action instead of just with the baptism of John. Now they further showed baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus, showing the fact that they had believed on him. Again, we see some action taken when there is repentance. Acts chapter 20, down here in verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. When you act on the word of repentance, you will also do something positively with your faith towards God. Repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. They had to repent, change their mind, but they also showed forth faith, showing the forth again, that there was some active, active uh, evidence, the fact that they had repentance in their life. Acts chapter 26, verse 20. Here he says, he showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and through it all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So they were to repent, turn to God, same word, we're going to turn, or now we're going to turn towards God and do what he says. And also we see a further thing added to this about repentance. Do works meet for repentance. Now, this particular word, meet for repentance, repentance, is the same word. We see this number 514. Same word we saw over and used in, uh, uh, we saw it used in Matthew. It's also used over here in Luke chapter 3, verse 8, where he said, bring forth therefore fruits worthy, the word meet is, means worthy, that you're worthy of repentance. Otherwise, if you are worthy, really, of being recognized as one who has repented before God, you're going to bring forth fruit fruit in your life. So he's saying to them that now they have to go forth and they need to do, as it said, these works. So we go back to Acts 26. Your works, which is your actions, your deeds, the things that you do, show forth whether there's repentance. Again, we're driving this home to you that true repentance is a change of mind shown also coupled with a turning to God and a change of action carrying out what he says. Otherwise, you, can't, you don't have true repentance if you don't stop doing what you've been doing and start doing the things that God tells you to do. Without doing and bringing forth the fruit, God does not recognize any repentance in a person's life. We see a scripture over in Romans in chapter 2. Now, God, of course, wants to bring us to repentance. And it says here, about the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Whenever we've walked in a wrong way, God is a good God. And He is coming to us to try to get us to repent, change our ways, change our mind, change what we're doing, so that we don't continue in it. The goodness of God will always lead you to repent, change your ways, change your mind, so that you will not continue to walk in those ways. But He goes on and says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That tells you something else. When the word comes to you, 
You're always to be ready to repent, believe the gospel, and act upon it and carry it out. If you don't, then essentially you have disobeyed and you've rejected it. And what does it produce? Hardness of heart. Hardness and impenitent, which means no change of mind. It would be the opposite. Notice what the word is. It's a, got an a before it, which is referring to not, essentially not, metanotus. Otherwise, no repentance, essentially, is what the word means. So an impenitent heart means you haven't repented. And this tells you that if you do not repent when the word of God comes to you, it actually produces a hardness of heart. That's why it's so important to always be ready to receive the word, act upon it, put it in operation in your life. Otherwise, if you don't, and you just kind of just gonna stand offish to it, and you don't co incorporate it in your lifestyle, you actually, whether you realize it or not, it produces a hardness of heart within you. That's why you gotta realize what we do with God's word is important. So, and it even says you treasure up wrath against the day of wrath when the righteous judgment of God comes because of the fact that we have hardened our heart. And that's what happened to those guys in Hebrews. Talks about over in Hebrews in chapter 3. They wouldn't listen to his voice. They wouldn't hear his voice. In verse 7, he said, Today, wherefore as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation of the day of temptation in the wilderness. They wouldn't obey. They wouldn't listen. In other words, when God's word comes to you, it's not just like, well, I'm just going to kind of go on my way. I'll think about it. That's a mistake. You actually, you think that, well, that didn't have any negative effect. Oh, yes, it did. You hardened your heart every time you have rejected the word of God in some capacity. You see, when you're meeting with God and his word's coming to you, it's a serious business. It's serious business. God is bringing his eternal word, which is going to bring life and change and victory in your, into you. And he expects us to take hold of it. Otherwise, we harden our heart. And what happened, of course? He said, I was agreed with that generation. They always err in their heart. And so they're not, they're not going to know my ways. They've not known my ways. If you don't receive his word and act on it and take hold of it, you'll not know his ways. You'll be left out of revelation. You won't have the revelation of his ways. That's why we always got to be ready to take hold of his Remember how we receive the word? We have a ready reception that's offered to us, and we lombano it, take hold of the word to apply it in our life and put it into operation. And that is so important if we're going to see God bring forth what he purposes. Let's go back over to Romans chapter 2 for a moment, though. Romans 2, where we're in verse 5, and he talks about this judgment that would come. Verse 6 says, He will render to every man according to his deeds. That means if we have the response, proper response of of doing works, meet for repentance, then we're going to get blessed because we've acted on his word. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing, what they do? They take hold of the word, they do it. What are they doing? They're seeking for glory, honor, and immortality in eternal life. That's why every time you receive God's word and you take hold of it and apply it in your life, you're doing the right thing. You're responding with well-doing. And you're seeking for glory, Im honor, and immortality in eternal life. See, God takes notice of what you do with his word every time you hear it. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, those that won't take hold of it and apply it in their life, but obey unrighteousness, what happens to them? Indignation and wrath. Judgment is going to come upon them in their life. That's why you and I, we have got to be in the place where we have a reception to the word, we're taking hold of the word, and we're putting it into operation in our life. Of course, what do you got to do? You got to check out the things first that are said to be sure it's in line with the word, like the Bereans did. But once you know it's in line with the word, don't be standoffish to it. Otherwise, the effect is we harden our heart. Now, in Romans chapter 11, verse 29, we see something. It says, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Otherwise, God doesn't regret or change what he has called you to. This is why perhaps you haven't entered into the gifts or the calling of God upon your life yet. But he hasn't changed his mind. They're without repentance. That, those gifts are still there. That calling is still upon you in your life. God wants you to enter into taking hold of all the things that he's given to you, taking hold of the ministry, taking the gifts that he's given you, and 
the calling of God on your life to carry it out. So don't think, you know, well, I, I didn't follow what God told me to do. Does that mean I missed it? And so now the calling of God's gone. Oh, no, it's still there. That's one thing. He doesn't change his mind on. The gifts and the calling of God is there. That's why he wants you to seek him, seek him to find the gifts that he's given to you and the calling of God, the things he wants you to do, and enter into him, regardless of what your age is or what situation you're in, because you want to enter into him in your life. Now, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we see something important beginning here in verse 8. Here, he's coming to the Corinthian church, and he says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. See, you can have sorrow over something that is not godly sorrow. It's just sorrow over circumstances, something that you lost, something that you don't have anymore, you get caught in something, some negative thing, a worldly kind of sorrow over circumstances. But he says here, you sorrowed to repentance. You are not, and, but you are made sorry after a godly manner. But you might receive damage by us and nothing. See, some people, when the, the word comes to them, if they don't receive it with a godly sorrow, they'll get an attitude or they'll feel hurt because of what so-and-so did instead of taking hold of it and applying it in their life and receiving a godly sorrow, which is what they should, in response to the word that came to them. That's why it says that you might receive damage by us and nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Sorrow of the world, again, is... You know, sorrow over loss, sorrow over something that happened, sorrow over some negative thing out there in the world, something that didn't work out for you or whatever kind of a thing. What we want is godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is what is important because we should have a godly sorrow about whether we obeyed God or not. And if we didn't, a godly sorrow that we didn't do what God told us to do, not just the ramifications of our sin, of what we lost and all the negative things. There should be a godly sorrow. That's what God is looking at. Now, godly sorrow is what works true repentance. If there isn't a godly sorrow, you'll just be sorrowful over the circumstance, and then you'll just continue, and you'll do it again when a better circumstance comes, and you'll just continue on your way. But a godly sorrow will bring a true repentance that you will not continue in that wrong way again. The sorrow of the world over Oral, the certain negative thing that occurred works death. But godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Now, if we have a right attitude of true repentance with godly sorrow, he says, Behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what did it do for you? What carefulness? Now, the word carefulness is the word spude, which refer, means diligence. What diligence? Young's brings this out. It is the word which is, means diligence. Spude means that. What diligence it wrought in you. In other words, when there's a godly sorrow, you just weren't going to be lazy, you know, just kind of just taking it as it goes or whatever. It's going to bring a diligence effort on, and a promptness and earnestness for you to do something and get something right right now when you have a godly sorrow. What clearing of yourselves? Now, how are you going to clear yourself? You're going to confess your sin. You're going to confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cl cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You're going to repent and turn from that. You're going to have the attitude, the fact that, hey, I can't continue in this thing ever again. I've got to get myself cleared. What indignation? This word refers to, as you see what it means, indignation, only used one time, but it means like, like an inner irritation or being vexed, you, otherwise you really have an, an irritation within the fact that you let this happen and let this get a hold of you and that you got into this thing, that this was a way of sin that's not what God wanted you to do. I mean, you know, you should have an inner kind of irritation in the fact that, you know, that's just, I should not have let this happen in my life. I should not have been doing this. I should be irritated with my actions because they were not of God. What fear? The fear of God. The fear of God coming upon you because you know that if when you walk contrary to his word, what's going to happen? Judgments are going to come. The fear of God, the fact that, uh-oh, 
You know, when I don't walk right, the fear of God, that, in fact, that I'm going to have see judgments and destructive things are coming my way. What vehement desire, what longing, there would be a longing within you, earnestly desiring to want to do what is right. A strong desire to want to get things right and make sure that you've got things right. So what's that going to do? That vehement, that strong desire is going to get you in the Word. That you're going to get the Word before you, and you're going to make sure, I don't fall this, I don't make this mistake again. I am going to make sure that I walk the right way with this because of this godly star. I am not about to do anything to God again by disobeying Him or, res or not following what He says. And what zeal, what zeal. I mean, you are zealous to get this thing right. You have a zeal about you and that you are going to move forward and make sure that this never happens again. You're zealous. Zealous is really going to dr drive from within, from your heart, to make sure you're doing what God wants. What revenge? You're going to take revenge against the enemy because you're going to resist his temptations from now and you're going to cast out the demons that came in from your sin because they came in. And you're going to come out, go after the enemies so you get yourself free. That's also part of the clearing of yourself. Not only confess your sin, but getting all the evil out of you. In all these things, you've approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. In other words, when you have sinned, godly sorrow that works repentance will produce a diligence such that you will do what you need to do to clear yourself of the sin and get the demons out. You will have an indignation or irritation with yourself in the sense that, I can't believe I let that happen, did those kind of things. You know, you're gonna, you should be irritated with yourself for walking contrary to the word. The fear of God, because I know that judgments come from this and I gotta get this turned around now or I'm gonna have more judgments. That a strong longing and desire to do what's right, the zeal, to make, it's going to drive you to do those things and revenge against the enemy who you yielded to so that you don't give place to him again. That is all involved in approving yourself to be cleared in a matter. When you carry out these things, that shows real repentance. Otherwise, real repentance isn't just change the mind and kind of go on my own way and not do anything about it. No, it's going to motivate you to action to get in the Word, to do the Word, to deal with the enemy, to make sure that you got things right. And you're not going to just be kind of haphazard about it. You're going to be diligent. You're going to be zealous. You're going to have an irritation with yourself. I mean, you're going to make something right now. That's the attitude. That's the attitude you should have. Now, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21, the problem with here at Corinth was they weren't repenting. He says, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, that I shall bewail men, many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and the fornication and the lasciviousness which they've committed. They were involved in sexual sin and they hadn't repented it. Their uncleanness, general uncleanness, or lustful, impure things. Fornication, which means any kind of sexual sin which includes anything that is contrary to what God wants, not just intercourse. We're talking about all kinds of sexual sin, the petting, all, any of that kind of stuff, anything that is sexually provocative that's doing those things outside of marriage that you have no business doing. Lasciviousness, unbridled lust, lust at work in your life. No, we can't have those kind of things. We're not supposed to allow any of that to happen in our life until we're in a marriage relationship which they have committed, all these things. And so he says, you guys haven't repented of this stuff. And then he says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Hey, you already came to him twice before. Now he's coming to him a third time. And he's saying, look, I told you once. I came to you a second time. Now I'm coming to you a third time. They should have hearkened to it the first time. That meant they hardened their heart the first time. Second time, they hardened their heart again. And now he says, I'm coming a third time. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And he says, I told you before, and I foretell you as if I were present the second time. Being absent now, I write to them which are here for to have sinned and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. Otherwise, I'm going to deal with the situation. And see, he would bring judgments. Remember what happened over in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5. 
See, they had problems with all kinds of sexual things going on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when, when they wouldn't deal with a guy who was committing incest, what did he do? He came and he gathered them with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and delivered the one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That the spirit may be saved, that doesn't mean that it's going to be saved, not automatic. How do you know? Because you've got to look up the word. Subjunctive mood. Aorist tense, passive voice, meaning somebody else is going to produce the salvation, which is the Lord. Aorist tense, meaning, which would be translated might instead of may. Usually present tense ones are may. Aorist tense, which is simple past, would be might, be better translated. And subjunctive is conditional upon conditions being met. Otherwise, that the Spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus if the conditions are met, which are what? Repentance. You know, you're going to deliver you to Satan for the destruction of your flesh. That means, guess what? The devil's coming on you, and you're going to have all kinds of problems. And if you don't repent, look out. You aren't going to make it. But if you do repent, then you can get saved. Then you, your spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So here he's coming to him, and he's after him because of the fact that they will not repent. We should never have that happen in our life. If we're hearkening to his voice and doing what he says, then we, we should be responding immediately. Remember, God's, he's not wanting to bring judgment on people. And he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. But at the same time, he's expecting us to respond to his word. And he shouldn't have to be after us and after us and after us and after us and beating us over the head to try to get us to the place of repentance. And the reality is, if we're resisting him, we're hardening our heart every time. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. We're dealing with people, we've got to be gentle, but we still tell them the truth. In meekness, the attitude, gentleness and mildness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Who's opposing themselves? Somebody that's walking in sin, somebody that's doing contrary to the word of God, walking in the flesh, doing the things of the world, giving place to the devil and not doing the word of God in some capacity. Why are they opposing themselves? Because they're giving place to the devil from sin and letting the enemy come in and steal, kill, and destroy in some aspect in their life. So they're actually against themselves, which is their spirit, instead of seeing, being walking in the spirit to see God's blessings. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging the truth, this tells you another thing. Repentance doesn't come just because you decide that you're going to confess your sins and everything is going to be great and that God will take care of it. He'll just forgive me and, get, and uh, he'll give me repentance. No. It says he gives repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Otherwise, God only grants repentance to those saying, yes, this is a true repentance. When you have come to the acknowledging of the truth, which means that you turn from the error, the thing that's contrary to the truth, and you start walking in the way of the truth, the Word of God. So, that's another aspect of repentance. Repentance is only granted or given to you by God when you acknowledge the truth. And if you acknowledge the truth, what does this mean? The word acknowledge means precise and correct knowledge. We've seen this word. We've talked about precise, correct knowledge. In other words, you have to get precise, correct knowledge of the truth, exactly what it says, not what you think it says, or what so-and-so says, or, or I think it's half, okay, I kind of change ways here because I think it says this. No, you got to know exactly what it says. You've got to get in the Word and know exactly what the Word says, and whatever the Word says, you are expected to carry out the precise, correct knowledge of the truth of God's Word and do it in your life. And then he goes on and says, and that they, who's that? The person who's in captivity, may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him, by the devil, at his will, the devil's will. The devil can come and take a person captive who has walked in ways of sin because he has opposed himself, giving place to him by walking in sin. And unless he comes to the place of repent of, the, of acknowledging or of getting precise correct knowledge of the truth the word in him that he chooses to act on and change and start walking in God's not going to give him repentance and but if once he receives that now he's going to have to also show some action 
he's going to have to recover himself out of the snare of the devil. Because he let the devil come in, he's got to get himself out of it. And he's not going to say, let, well, God, I want you to get me out of it. Well, God does it by his power, but who's, who's responsible to, to act on the word to get himself out of it? You are. They may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You're going to have to cast the demons out of yourself. You had a lot of sin and let a lot of stuff in. Don't think, oh, everything will be gone. Great, I've confessed, I'm not doing it anymore. Well, how about all the devils that came in? How about all the destruction that you let in by opening up the door? You're going to have to cast those demons out and recover yourselves out of the snare of the devil. He took you captive at his will. He's nailed you to the wall, essentially. He's got you. Well, we're going to have to recover ourselves, and it's our responsibility to do it, and we can do it. Now, another place we see over in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 we see in verse 4. And this is, remember, this is before we were talking about going on to perfection here, of leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. And all these doctrinal stands that should be foundational in our life. It says in verse 4, for, for it is impossible to those who were once enlightened. This is the guy who got born again. He's gotten light. Light came to him. The word came to him. He was enlightened with truth. And have tasted the heavenly gift. He got born again. Remember the gift of righteousness, gift of eternal life. And were made partakers or sharers or partners of the Holy Ghost, which meant they received the Holy Spirit. Because every one of us received the Holy Spirit. We're all partners or sharers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God. Now, this is not talking about the Logos. The main most, the word mostly translated is Logos for the word word. But this is talking about the Rhema, that which has been spoken. In other words, they had God speaking to them. They heard his voice. They tasted the good spoken word of God that was spoken to them. This shows that these guys weren't some nominal Christian. They had revelation and they were hearing God speak to them. God was bringing revelation to them. And they also knew of the powers of the world to come. The word world actually means the age. It's not the word cosmos, it's the word aeon, which means the age. Powers of the age to come. These guys had operated in the power of God, and they, had, they knew God's voice. They were hearing, that meant they come to a level of maturity. Then it says, if they shall fall away, which is a mistake in the King James. Because the word if is not if. It means and. And, not if. The word chi is the conjunction, and, or, or also sometimes translated but. But and is the, not the word for if. <clears throat> then when it says fall away, this particular word is a participle in the aorist tense, which is a past tense participle. The way you would translate this and having fallen away, the way Young's translated, which is accurate, exactly what should be. In other words, this doesn't say, well, if they might fall away down the line. No, this is talking about the guy who already was at a level of maturity, and having fallen away, he turned away from the Lord. He's left him, essentially. And we talk about this particular word, uh, fall away. This particular word, is talking about deviating from the right path, but it also is referring here to the fact that this person has essentially apostatized, committed apostasy, and turned away from the Lord. When you look up this particular word, uh, this is what it refers to in some of the places in the, uh, uh, in some of the, uh, Lo, Lo, Louis, Lo, I can't pronounce his name, Lo Nita. They are one of the lexicons. It means to abandon former relationship and Freiburg also says the same thing. These guys have lexicons that are very good. And he talks about abandoning or committing apostasy or having left their relationship with God. That's what the word means. Having left God, a relationship, apostatized. It said it's impossible to renew, and this particular word renew means to renovate. Complete renovation. Again, Otherwise, they've been through the renovation process. God had done this work, renovated them. They come to the place of hearing his voice, knowing the power of God. They've grown up in some level of maturity. 
it's impossible to renovate them again unto repentance, unto a change. They already had been changed. And then they left what they'd been changed to. So he's saying it's impossible to bring them now unto a change because they already were at the change, essentially, because they'd already had seen that happen. And now they'd been changed. They came to the reality of everything, and they apostatized. They left him. And God doesn't go for, go for that whatsoever. Because it says, See, and they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That's one thing. A person who would apostatize or turn away, God says that that person cannot again have go through the renovation process again to come to the place of repentance and change and change of action. He already was at that place and he left it. God's not going to sit there and redo this thing again because he's crucifying the Son of God and putting him afresh and putting him to an open shame. Now there's another place over in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, we pick up here in verse 11. And he says, Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous, and nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. He talks about how the lift up the hands, make straight paths for your feet, all these things, follow peace with all men, holiness without which no man shall, shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, as any man fail the grace of God, how people could be defiled. He says, lest there be any fornicator, perform, profane person as Esau. And he says, know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Because he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Why? Because he gave up the birthright. The birthright is the sonship. He gave up his right as the firstborn. In doing so, he couldn't get it back. That shows the fact that it's possible for someone, we talked about this on the spiritual birthright teachings that we did some time ago, that Esau sold his birthright. In doing so, then there was no repentance for him. That's the same kind of thing. He wanted to get it back, and he wanted the blessing, but he couldn't do it. He was rejected. He found no place of repentance, even though he sought it carefully with tears, as it says. Then we come down further. And we see in verse 25, it goes to this place and says, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. In other words, when God speaks to us, he wants us to respond to him. If we turn away from him that speaks to us, are we going to escape? Escape the effects of it? the hardening of heart and the judgment that would come. Because remember, the guy who doesn't, doesn't listen to him and obey, he's going to be in trouble. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. What will be shaken? Everything is going to be shaken. What, what, what will remain? All the things that are of him. But the things that are not of him of course, those are the things that are going to be shaken and fall. He goes on and says, Wherefore we receive in a kingdom which, we cannot, which cannot be removed. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In other words, God wants us to serve him acceptably with godly fear, reverence before the Lord. For our God is a consuming fire, which means if you don't serve him and don't respond to his voice, and you resist what he tells you to do, he's a consuming fire, that's not a good report. That's called vengeance coming. God's vengeance would come upon a person, and destruction would come. Therefore, we've got to make our path straight. We can't be falling, failing from the grace of God. We certainly cannot be giving up our birthright, and we cannot be one of those who's going to not listen to what he says. Otherwise, judgments are going to come upon us. And that's the, where repentance comes in, we can't just confess our sin and think that everything's going to be great. No. If God told you to do something, and, well, you confessed your sin, but did you go back and do the things that he told you to do? Or are you continuing to not do what he told you to do? If you don't start doing the things that he already told you to do, you haven't repented. You're still under judgment. You haven't brought forth fruit. This is from God's perspective. See, repentance just isn't a little change of mind game. It's shown in action. It's the real deal. Hey, I told you to do something. Let's do it. 
Let's walk in it. You can't and harden our heart doesn't make it. It's important that we understand God's perspective on these things. Second Peter chapter three, over in verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That tells us something. If we, like we saw, if we don't repent, we perish. He doesn't want us to perish. He wants us all to come to the place of repentance. What's evidence of repentance? That we're doing what he says. He goes on and says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Otherwise, there's going to be a trial by fire of everything. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be or must you be, necessary, it's the word meaning must, must you to be in all holy conversation, which means manner of life and conduct, and godliness or reverence and respect towards God. Meaning the fact that, yeah, he's long-suffering, not willing to perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance. And because of that, he says, hey, you're going to have to walk a holy walk and walk in godliness if you're going to be one who is going to be uh, not in the perishing crowd. You're going to be in the One's going to see the eternal life crowd, praise God. He goes on and says, looking for and hastening for the coming of the day of God, when the heavens be on fire, will be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens, new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And then he says again, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, sparadzo, that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. That's what God wants us to be. Those are the ones that have shown forth by the fruit that they're walking with God. It's quite a statement. In other words, God's long-suffering not when anybody should perish, and so that's why he says, hey, make sure your manner of life and everything is right, and make sure that you're walking in peace, without spot, and blameless before him, because all the works are going to be examined, and they're going to be tried by fire. Now in Revelation chapter 2, we see some things. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. He said some good things about him, but then he says, I have something against thee because you left your first love. Well, what would God require if we have repentance? Not just confess the sin, I'm sorry I left my first love. Is that repentance? No. That's simply acknowledging your sin. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, otherwise, what, what did you quit doing? And repent, change your mind, change your action, which is going to be evidenced by what? Do the first works. Otherwise, go back to be doing the things that God wants you to do, told you to do, that you were doing, that you left and quit doing. Or else I'll come quickly and will move thy candlestick out of thy place. That means presence, the presence of God is uh, leaving, except thou repent. Quite a statement. We see another place over in verse 16. He says to these guys, they were, what the problem was, they had a few, he had a few things against them. They were holding wrong doctrines. They had the doctrine of Balaam and eating things, sacrificed idols, and they were committing fornication. And he says, I hate these, they, he hated the doctrine of Nicolaitans. And, and he says, repent, or else I'll come into thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Otherwise, judgment was going to come upon them if they didn't repent of these wrong doctrines and wrong actions that they were carrying out. Then in verse 21, or back up to verse 20, he's talking about Jezebel allowing her to come and teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols, evil things going on in the church. Remember, this is in the church. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. One thing about God, remember, he's not wanting to bring judgment. He is long-suffering, not willing any should perish. He's merciful. He delights in mercy, not in judgment. And what does he say? I gave her space to repent. God will give you space to repent for a while. How long that is? Only God knows for sure. But one thing for sure, he doesn't give you space to repent forever. He gives you space for a while. But she repented not. And if you don't listen and hearken to him after a while, what's going to happen? Behold, I'll cast her into a bed, and they that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, of their actions. Otherwise, judgment 
is going to come. And notice, repentance is repentance of your deeds, not just an attitude of mind. It all comes back to actions, doesn't it? Doing the actions, doing the works, doing the things that God wants, showing the fruit. The fruit shows evidence of the fact that you're walking right. Revelation 3. Here he says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and you're dead. Otherwise, this guy's just living this, but he's, he's really dead, but he's just living a name. Living a, he's going a formality. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Otherwise, a whole lot of stuff's died out and you're about ready to, you're, everything's dying out of your life. For I've not found thy works perfect or filled up before God. It literally means filled up before God. He says, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. So otherwise, you should be receiving, you should be hearing and holding fast again now. You're going to have to go back to that because you quit doing that. You quit receiving, hearing, and holding fast. That's why we're always going to be hearing and taking hold to apply the word and holding fast to it. We're not going to let go of it. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. Hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, why are you watching? Because the enemy comes in, right? We watch so the enemy can't get in. They obviously weren't watching, and they let the enemy come in before and, and got them off track. Now he says, if you won't watch and you won't guard yourself, I'll come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I'll come upon thee. And what's going to happen? Judgment is going to come. You see, these, these guys, he was reading, reading their mail and reading the riot act to them, essentially. If you guys don't get right, you're going to have trouble here. Judgment's going to come your way. He even says, there's a few names in Sardis that have not defiled their garments. They shall walk me with white, for they are worthy. The same worthy is number 514, the same one we saw talking about worthy of repentance or fruits worthy of repentance. Why were they shown to be worthy or acceptable? Because they had the walk. They were walking in white. They weren't defiling their garments. That's, that's the fruit, isn't it, from the walk. And he goes on and says, he that conquers overcomes or conquers, the same will be clothed in white raiment. You've got to have to conquer the sin, conquer the flesh, conquer the devil, walk in the ways of the word, and you can because God is, a, is one who fights the battle for you and gives you the victory. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. That's quite a statement. If he says I'll not blot out his name out of the book of life, obviously he could blot their name out of the book of life. Why wouldn't he blot their name out of the book of life? Because they did conquer and they're clothed in white raiment and they're walking, of course, as it said, uh, worthy of him before the Lord. That tells us the fact that we have got to bring walk in his ways and with true repentance it's going to be shown by our walk. Then we see down in the Laodicean church. Oh, well, these guys, they were lukewarm. And they got spewed out. Well, if you're lukewarm, that, doesn't, that means you got some hot and you got some cold. You got some good things, but you got some bad stuff. Is that guy okay? No. He's going to be spewed out of his mouth. Does God want you to have any of this cold stuff? No. You've got to get rid of it. He goes on and says, these guys, of course, they were, they were comfortable in their situation, rich, increased with goods, need of nothing. He says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. And spiritually, that was their status. And of course, they had to go and buy gold tried in fire, which speaks of the word, that they might be rich, white raiment, which speaks of righteousness, that they might be clothed, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eyes south, so thou mayest see. See, they were all just running around in the natural, in the flesh. They need to get themselves awakened again to the ways of the Spirit. That's what we've got to be sure we're operating the Spirit. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God loves his people, and he comes to them to rebuke them and chasten them so they'll come to repentance. And he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be zealous. Otherwise, that's another point about which we saw back in 2 Corinthians. Being zealous to get after doing things and get things right, right away. Burning with zeal. I mean, if you're zealous and you're all burning with zeal, you get after that and do it like right now. You're not going to procrastinate and say, well, next week maybe I'll get to it. Oh, no. If something's got to be done right now, you're on it immediately. And that's what it's talking about. Get this thing right immediately. Same time. We see over in Revelation 9, verse 18, here's where judgment was beginning to come on these guys in the Revelation. 
And it says, the rest of the men that were not killed by the plagues yet repented not of their works of stone. In the midst of all the judgments, amazingly, they didn't repent. It's amazing. Some people, judgments keep coming, and they still won't repent. And that was their status. Then they rep didn't repent of their four murders, their sorceries, their fornication, their thefts. They continued in their own ways. Boy, it's amazing. But you know, when you get uh, a mind that's not tuned into God, and God, you get to be a, a reprobate, unapproved mind, that's what they get to. If you keep on hardening yourself and hardening yourself and hardening yourself by resisting, you'll get to the place where you won't even listen. Revelation 16, 9, here's again these guys. They were scorched with great heat, blasphemed the name of God, and they repented not to give him glory. That shows you that these guys had gotten so far down that they would not repent at the judgments of God. What does God want us to do? He wants us to understand true repentance and understand God's dealings. His dealings are that he's made a covenant with us. He's given us his word. He's given us everything that we have need of to walk in in life. And he wants us to walk in his ways. If we don't walk in his ways, he's going to come to us with his word in order to, for us to repent, change our mind, change our ways, get right, start walking right. Evidence of it is by action on the word, all those points we saw, diligence, fear of God, you know, being zealous to get things right, indignation, irritation with myself, confessing my sin, casting out these demons, dealing with all this stuff, choosing to go the way of the Lord, now seeing good fruit coming forth, evidence that I'm walking my works, I'm doing the work, showing forth that I'm worthy of repentance. Okay, I'm on track now. You know, I'm going to be doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. Evidence by your walk. I mean, think about it. The guy comes to you on the job and says, well, you've been doing this kind of the wrong way and it's messing up some things. Oh, he says, now you've got to change and do it this way. Well, you don't say, okay, uh, yeah, I understand that and I changed my mind, it's a good idea. But if you don't do it, you're going to get fired real quick. But if you do it and you're zealous, say, yes, sir, I'll get this thing right and I'll start doing it and you start doing it right and you're productive on the job and everybody's happy and they see the fact that you're carrying it out. That shows real repentance, doesn't it? The guy who doesn't carry out what's said has not repented. And what's going to happen to him eventually? <clears throat> He's going to see some judgment. God's long-suffering. He's merciful. But at the same time, he expects us to walk in his ways. So we've seen some important things from the Word of God showing what real repentance is in God's sight. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word regarding repentance that reveals unto us that repentance means change of mind accompanied with change of action by doing the works of the Word of God and carrying it out in my life, which means I cannot continue in the way of sin or in the way of the flesh or doing things contrary to your Word or I have not repented. Repentance is shown by my works. And if I quit doing something, but then went back and did it again, I never repented in the first place. Because my works, my fruit, has not shown that I truly repented. I understand that God looks on the heart. And from the heart proceeds activities and actions that I'm carrying out in my life. And if I don't respond to God's word, I understand I've hardened my heart. If I keep hardening my heart and doing the wrong thing, I will see judgments that will come upon me. And God recognizes that there's no repentance unless there's the change, not only of mind, but of action. I will change. I will be ready to do what God says. And I will be diligent. I will be zealous. I will be ready to clear myself by confession of sin, casting out demons, changing my mind, being zealous 
to do what God says with a fear of God before me, irritated with myself that I did not obey and coming against the enemy and not giving place to him again, I will show true repentance by my actions, by the fruit that comes forth in my life. This is a foundational principle that is established in me. For I hear and do your word. I am going to see fruit come forth. I will always have my repentance shoes on so I'm ready to change when God brings something to me that I need to act on and make a change in my life. And I will not resist and harden my heart which will take me down a path of destruction. I thank you, Lord, that I will have a tender heart. And I understand I've got to recover myself out of the snare of the devil, and I've got to come to the place of having the exact, precise, correct knowledge of God in doing what the Word says, so I will be given repentance by God, and then I can recover myself out of the snare of the devil. I can't get myself out of the snare of the devil if I haven't met God's condition of coming to the truth and doing what he says and having a heart that's right before him. So I walk in his ways. I thank you, Lord. I understand true repentance. There shall be true repentance in my life always so that I conquer all the enemy's works I hearken to God's voice, I bring forth fruit, and I walk in victory and please the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Important message, because most people, when they confess that when they have, I've seen this for years, all of, for years and years and years, got in trouble, confessed, did something wrong, I repent. I confess my sin, and then the next day, they're back to the same old thing. Or a week later, they're back to the same old thing. Did they deal with themselves? No. Why were they doing that? Because they had the judgment coming upon them and the ramifications of it. But did they get in the Word of God? And did they put the Word first place? Did they have the irritation over themselves? Were they zealous to get this thing right? Were they ready to deal with the devil and resist him? No. They didn't choose the way of the Lord, and they didn't have the fruit. And so they'd fall back in the same thing. And then, the more that they did it, the more they hardened their heart, and the harder it got to do the right thing because of a hardened heart. And that's how people go down the ways of backsliding. That's how people can fall away. That's why We've got to make sure that we always walk the straight and narrow and be obedient. Don't let any sin get a hold of you. Don't let it get a hold of you for a minute. Because the devil, he might come in and take an inch, and then he'll take a foot later on, and then he'll take a yard, and then he'll take you down the road, and pretty soon he's got a mile on you, and he's taking you right down of the path of destruction. That's what happened to these guys. They hardened their heart, and they couldn't enter into his rest, and they ended up dying out in the wilderness and did not enter in what God had for them. That's why we always got to be sensitive to have our repentance shoes on and be ready to receive the word, take hold of it, act upon it, and do it in our life. It means you, what's that mean? You got to deny yourself. Well, I don't want to do it. Well, <laughs> you're in trouble. Well, my flesh kind of wants to do such and such, or, you know, this is the way I react, or whatever. I'm not gonna, that's not going to hold water with God. There is no excuses for not doing God's word. Well, the devil made me do it. Well, it doesn't work. Yeah, the devil influenced you, but who did it? You did it. Do you have authority over the devil? Yes. Can you resist the devil? Yes. Can you choose the way of the Lord? Yes. If we don't choose the way of the Lord, what's happened? Nobody can be responsible. Nobody can point fingers. It's all, I didn't choose to hearken to his voice. That's why true repentance has got to be shown in our life. And when you have this down, and you do those things in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and you carry out all those things, you will be cleared in that matter, and you'll have a godly sorrow that works repentance unto salvation that will produce the life of God.
and the victory in your life. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We're going to be hearers and doers of the word. Thank you for the revelation of true repentance. Thank you, Lord. We will always be ready to repent and act on your word and see your victory come forth in our life. Thank you for all you've accomplished. There'll be much fruit from this message because we will hear it and do it. In Jesus' name, amen.